Bhavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Badang Dhammang Sanggang Namasami Katam Buddha Saratindiva Viti Patanti Te Pabhajitena Abhinnam Pachave Kitabang The days and nights are relentlessly passing. How well am I spending my time? This is to be reflected again and again by one who has gone forth. So, greetings, everyone. It, uh, I would say it's good to see you, but uh, I didn't bring my binoculars or magnifying glass. Um, but yeah, it looks like there are a lot of people there, which is, is wonderful. Um, so just a little bit of a, a preview for what the morning will look like. So um, I'll give some reflections. And then after that, we'll have a couple of the uh, larger community members. So I believe Xander and Katie and maybe others um, who are currently moving from one place to another, who are uh, shifting their life trajectory in significant ways will come up and, and do some sharing. And then, as Ajahn Nisabo mentioned, uh, we'll hopefully, um, well, he'll be able to hand out the malas, these uh, Buddhist prayer beads, which we had blessed in Thailand and in India. So, yeah, I thought it would be a, a nice thing to have a broader theme of time and and timelessness in a in a Buddhist in a Buddhist context in a meditation context. Um, so I thought I might start off with just giving a little bit of history of my own uh, my own mala beads. So in thinking about uh, this talk, I was thinking, oh gosh, when did I when did I get these this this pair of beads that I've had for a long time? And uh, I realized that. Uh, of all my possessions, they are the fourth oldest. So uh, the two oldest items that I've been carrying around with me for the last 14 years are these two little Buddha statues. So one was given to me by my mother and one was given to me by my father. And I've carried those around in my shrine everywhere I've gone, everywhere I've lived for the, the last 14, 15 years. And then my alms bowl, which I was given... Uh, 14 years ago when I ordained as a Samanera. And then after that, it's this, uh, it's this mala. So these uh, beads are something which can, can and do uh, live on with us. We can live and imbibe them with meaning. We can, in the words of uh, Kitty Saro, one of my, uh, one of my friends here at Dharmaram Buddhist University, uh, he calls potentize. We can potentize the moments of our life. We can potentize, make potent, uh, fill and enrich our lives and literally the things of our lives. We can, we can and do give them meaning uh, by the way we interact with them. So I thought it'd be interesting to think about the different parts of a mala. So roughly speaking, you've got three parts of mala. So mala is a, a Sanskrit and a Pali word, which just means... Um, it means a garland, uh, but in the way that we use it in modern uh, modern English, at least, I believe mala is a, an English word now, uh, is as a prayer bead. So it's almost a, a Buddhist rosary. So it's not just any kind of uh, beaded necklace, but broadly speaking, a, a Buddhist rosary, a mala has three components. It's got these wooden beads, and depending on what uh, size you have. It might have 108 wooden beads, so the primary uh, primary part, uh, most of the weight of a mala comes from these wooden beads. And then you have these spacers, which are on 108 bead mala, they come uh, roughly every uh, 28th bead. So the uh, 108 bead mala is broken up into four sections by these spacers. So one section spacer, another section spacer, another section spacer, and then your final section, and then the guru bead as the top. 
Um, and then the third section, uh, or the third part, the third ingredient um, of a mala is the string. Um, so just as I'm here talking about, talking around and around about uh, malas, just invite everyone to think about malas as metaphors and what are the what are the wooden beads of your life? What are the spacer beads, these special beads which come every every so often? And what is the string? What is the thing which uh, is a through line through our life, through our practice? And these things can change and perspectives on them change. And uh, it's interesting to just ask this question of oneself. And I'll just give a, a bit of a, a spoiler alert, is that uh, one way of thinking about the string is as just this present moment awareness. So what we were hopefully all trying to tap into or experience in that guided meditation in any kind of meditation is an expansive awareness that isn't biased by our liking and our disliking, but is just here and now in the present moment. So that's what takes us through all the individual events and mind states throughout our life is this, uh, this awareness and um, yeah, just metaphors can only go so far, but see if you can take this through line through the whole talk and through the rest of your day, through the rest of uh, life really. So um, yeah, just maybe a little bit more story about this mala. So uh, I got this mala, yeah, I mentioned t about 10 years ago. Uh, I was in my uh, third year in robes, third or fourth year in robes. And some people think that when you go to a monastery, when you take ordination, we literally say, uh, household life is cramped and dusty, but the homeless life is free as air. So, but... And that's great, that's beautiful. Um, but you find when you enter a monastery that monastery life can be cramped and dusty as well and the heart can become uh, dry and uh, sometimes you need to revamp and really take a, a different perspective on your life. And that's kind of how I was feeling in my, my third year in robes and it's like, okay, I gotta shift, shift tactics and my meditation just wasn't going very well at all. So I'm like, okay, shift gears, uh, need to have a, a special bead in here uh, in my life. So basically um, asked permission for during the winter retreat, the three months of the winter retreat, rather than uh, just meditating, formal sitting and walking meditation like all the other monks are doing, I asked if I could do a bowing pilgrimage or basically a bowing retreat. So I uh, got permission from Ajahn Pasana to try one of these uh, 100,000 prostration um, marathons really that um, Tibetan monks do on a regular basis and uh, this is something which is very common in the Tibetan tradition and I look at them and you got all these buff Tibetan monks and uh, yeah it's it's impressive and having uh, things that you can do as a monk are, are exciting because oftentimes it seems like it's just uh, one brown bead after another um, so I start and figure out okay three months 100,000 prostrations that's 1,111 a day all right, let's see what that looks like. And I start doing it. And at that time, I didn't yet have the mala. So I just start out counting with rocks. So I wasn't very uh, mature or sophisticated in my counting, but just had 108 rocks that I kept in a little sack. And I would count those. I'd do a full prostration, standing up, bending down, and uh, bowing to a, a Buddha statue, taking refuge in the, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. And then I'd move one rock from my 108 pile over to the right. And then I do that uh, 100, 1,111 times. Um, I don't remember the math now, but somehow I, I made it work. Maybe I had bigger rocks, which helped me count the smaller rocks. Um, but in any event, it wasn't very sophisticated. I highly recommend malas for anyone that's, yeah, if you want to be counting the moments of your life, uh, yeah, just plain rocks in a sack, not uh, not the best. So uh, recommend picking up a mala if you're at all inclined. But then after that, I didn't yet think of mala somehow, I had, but I'd seen one of these uh, kind of movie ticket counters. We've, we've got such things in monasteries, and this is big in Chinese monasteries where you can count your, uh, you can count your repetitions. And I've got uh, Chinese monk friends who are basically just constantly using one of these clickers and 
you know, we'll do uh, thousands and thousands of short mantras in a day. So that was my next step. But I actually got one of these and then I broke it and then I fixed it and then it broke again. So I'm like, okay, how else can I count? And I don't know what Mara was blocking my site, but I ended up thinking, oh, Mala. Yeah, they've been using these for uh, centuries. Uh, so why don't I get one of those? And I uh, did. I found this in the stores at um, storage at Abayagiri. And basically, it's lived with me ever since. And it's counted many things, many moments in my life. And it's just uh, a beautiful thing when I'm not actively counting prostrations or counting mantras. It's up on my shrine. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I can be bowing to it if I'm not actively counting. And just for people's awareness, or if people um, end up wanting a mala, uh, you can count it. You can count your um, recitations of refuge. This is something which Ajahn Nisibo has set up on the Clear Mountain Monastery website. Uh, many people are already counting their number of times they take refuge. So with each bead saying, Budang Saranangachami, I take refuge in the Buddha. Dhammang Saranangachami, I take refuge in the Dhamma. Sangang Saranangachami, I take refuge in the Sangha. Uh, all in all in Pali, if you'd like. And then you go to the next bead. Budang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami, Sangang Saranangachami, Budang Saranangachami, Dhammang Saranangachami, Sangang Saranangachami. And you'll notice when you do that, that for most of the time, if you give yourself enough, enough spaciousness, then most of the time your finger is actually on the string and I'm waiting for that next bead. And that's, again, this, this present moment, this spacious awareness. Um, but you can count your, your prostrations, count your recitations, uh, and then post them um, anonymously or otherwise on the Clear Mountain Monastery webpage. But if you do 28 bows or mantras in a day, so that's basically the length from uh, the first bead up to the first spacer, up to and including the first spacer, that's 28 bows or mantras a day, then you'll have over 10,000 in a year. You'll have something like 10,010 uh, bows or prostrations in a year. And again, what do these numbers mean? They don't mean much, but they are cool. They are cool. And uh, if you like counting and measuring uh, <laughs> things, then it's something you can do, something you can measure. Um, can you actually measure how high your mindfulness is based on the number of prostrations or whatever you've done? No, not really. But you can stay with the present moment uh, and yeah, then your numbers are again potentized. Uh, if you do 274 mantras in a day, so that's uh, just a bit over two and a half times around this mala. So 108 bead mala times two, you go around and then around and a half uh, then you get to uh, about 274 mantras a day, and that's 100,000 in a year. So again, just fun with numbers, fun with numbers, and fun with malas. So uh, thought it would be interesting to just look at the broader um, metaphor of this mala, this four-piece mala, as uh, ways of looking at a human life, different ways that people count their life, so if you go back, many people will have heard that, oh yeah, you know, the uh, in, in India, they used to count the life by, you know, these different phases where you're a householder and then you renounce and then, you know, you have these different, you know, several phases. This is called the uh, ashrama dharma. Um, so the ashramas basically can translate as phases of life. And there are roughly four different phases of life in this Indian system, which is mentioned in the Ramayana and the Law of Manu and elsewhere. But the first stage, uh, which is the first stage of one's life, the first, say, 20 or so years of one's life, this is the brahmacharya, uh, the student phase. Uh, if you're a Brahmin, then you're, um, yeah, this is the study phase of life. And that's uh, something to take note of. The second phase, so the next 20 or so years, is the garhastya or the grihsta uh, phase phase, and this is basically being a householder. Then after that, where you have a family and you have a job and uh, take care of your family, etc. The third phase is the vana prastya. So this is where you start moving into renunciation in this uh, Brahmanic scheme of things, this Indian scheme of things, where you go and station yourself, prastaya, 
in the vana, in in the forest. So basically moving away from society. And the final uh, stage of a Brahminic life is the sannyasin, where you're really just uh, putting everything down to the extent that you can. So that's an interesting four-part system. Um, if you look at, there's a great book, a modern book by Oliver Berkman called 4,000 Weeks. And in that, basically, Oliver Berkman, Berkman <laughs> breaks down that uh, a 77 year life, which is a bit more than the average American lifespan, uh, that breaks down to about 4,000 weeks. So you can think of that in terms of each phase of your life is a thousand weeks, a thousand weeks, a thousand weeks. And where are you on your, your mala? If you were to uh, think about things, where are you in this mala of life? Uh, in America, uh, we've got <laughs> just weird ways of counting time. Um, so in one's youth, you know, the from birth, you live, and then uh, you might have a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah, which isn't necessarily weird. That's a significant way of, of counting transition into, uh, into adulthood, uh, or just when you get your driver's license, you know, just a uh, somewhat meaningful thing, or when you go off to college. And these things can have meaning, but they only have the positive meaning that you you give to them. So this first period, you're a kid, you're living with your parents, and then you move away, and then you maybe get a job, maybe have a family, um, and then this next phase of your life, your midlife, you have a midlife crisis, you go buy a Ferrari or uh, whatever you do, or you get some promotion, you're counting your life based on uh, based on money or goods, and then you retire. And this last period is, is that uh, in the... Buddhist scheme of things, uh, there's another way of counting, uh, which the Buddha spoke about ogas or floods, and he didn't specifically relate it to phases of life, but I think it roughly does match. So the first phase of life can be conceived of as this avij oga, where you're just flooded by ignorance, the flood of ignorance. So we're basically just figuring out about the world. It's the first, say, 20 years of your life or so. Then the next 20 are basically this flood of sensuality. You're just moving into the world and moving about the world. Um, and again, this is not a positive Buddhist framework, but it's the, a framework for how most of us can live. Most, most people, American, whatever, um, if we're not actually looking at life and what a life can be, then we just get swept away with these things and get overwhelmed with these things. So the next phase is sensuality. We indulge in uh, all the beautiful sight, sound, smells, taste, touch. And then the next phase from maybe 40 to 60 is this bhavoga, where we're, it's the flood of becoming. We are just wanting to make our place in the workplace. we have just working our way up the ladder and just maybe writing books and just showing off who we are. And then after that is the ditoga, roughly speaking. So where we're just flooded with... Uh, attachment to views. So we're basically settled in what we think about life. So that's a um, yeah, a rather pessimistic view of life, but it, it's only pessimistic to, to the extent that we're uh, wasting our life. And those are just general trends which we can buck at any time. Uh, in a beautiful sutta, the Araka Sutta, um, where the Buddha uh, talks about um, yeah, the preciousness of life, he breaks it down uh, with some numbers as well just in Oliver Berkman style. Um, but he says, yeah, at present, practitioners, one speaking rightly would say, next to nothing is the lifespan of human beings, limited trifling of much stress and many despairs. One should touch the truth like a stage, sage and do what's skillful, follow a holy or spiritual life. For one who is born, there is no freedom from death. At present, one who lives a long time is 100 years old, or maybe a little bit more. So, and this is the Buddha talking, and he does some great off-the-cuff math, which is impressive. So living 100 years, one lives for 300 seasons. So 100 seasons of cold, heat, or rain. That is, and he continues, that's 1,200 months, or 400 months of cold, 400 of heat, 400 of rain. So this is the three-part um, uh, yearly seasons of, of India. And those 1,200 months are about uh, 2,400 fortnights. So 800 cold, 800 rain, rainy, 800 in the heat. That is 
and he didn't say this, but basically Oliver Berkman's, he was the original 4,000 weeks uh, person. But next he goes from fortnights to days. So that is 3, 000, uh, 36,000 days. 1,200 cold, 1,200 heat, 1,200 rain. That is one eats. So he goes from measuring by time to measuring by, by meals. So uh, many people, like my brother and some other people I know, actually take photos of every meal that they've eaten for the last however many, you know, 13 years. And you can tell them, okay, uh, maybe July 14th, 2012, and they can show you a picture of their waffle or whatever. So the Buddha was, you know, doing this as well, just saying how people count their days. That is one eats 72,000 meals. That's 24,000 meals in the cold, in the heat, and in the rain, counting the taking of mother's milk and obstacles to eating, which he defines as eating while suffering. So not eating while one is stressed or while sick or during uh, an observance day or when one is poor. So thus, practitioners, he has reckoned the life of a person for 100 years uh, in terms of seasons, years, months, fortnights, nights, days, and meals. So whatever a teacher, and this is the punchline, whatever a teacher should do seeking the welfare of their disciples out of sympathy for them, that I have done for you. Over there, the roots of trees, over there are empty dwellings. Practice meditation, practitioners. Don't be heedless. Don't later fall into regret. Regret. This is my message for you. So that's another way of looking at, uh, at life. That's a uh, a string, this string of appropriate attention, this string of present moment awareness. How well am I spending my time, the days and nights, all these uh, wooden beads of my meals and my days uh, and my years are, are passing by. But what is my awareness doing? Um, I did uh, apparently the, uh, I think it's the, yes, yeah, Social Security Administration has statistics on the numbers of people who've reached certain ages. So four out of 100,000 Americans will each th reach the age of 108, and 25 out of 100,000 females in America will reach the age of 108. So it's not impossible. But even if you did that, you know, and then every wooden bead, if every wooden bead on your mala was one year of your life, and that's, I mean, that's, yeah. Uh, this, the chances that everybody in this space is going to live to 108, it's pretty small. But uh, yeah, what, what is our life? And uh, our, our life string can be cut off at any, any moment. So yeah, look at this. What, is, what are the, the wooden beads of your life? How are you counting your days? How are your days passing? And what are the significant events of your life? Are they, uh, yeah, are you counting your life by... Um, Every 5 p.m. when you get off work, are you counting your life by every new car that you get? Are you counting your life? These are the uh, the agate, the Montana agate, these spacer beads. Are you counting, are the special days, the special moments of your life? Um, yeah, when you get a promotion, when you get a raise, uh, are you, are the best days of your life when you get something? Or are they when you give something? Are they uh, the moments when you go to your first meditation retreat or when you meet your life partner, your real Kalyanamitta, or when you've gone to a monastery and ordained um, these significant transition moments of life, these can be thought of as the agate beads or the Montana agate as they are with uh, the beads which Ajahn Nisibo will hand out on these malas. Uh, but really we can populate our our mala with as many spacers, with as much uh, special beads we can potentize and bring meaning to our life and add as many spacers as we want. And it really uh, can then become an adornment for, for our life. You can carry your mala with you everywhere you go, wear it all the time, keep it on your shrine as just a reminder. And just constantly, the closer you keep it to you or the more often you remember it and actually use it, uh, then the more you can give and actually realize and give attention to this uh, exceedingly important question of how well am I spending my time? Uh, what 
what is the through line? What is, what is the present moment and how well am I knowing it? Um, to what extent am I uh, with this, this heart-based knowing? So close the talk here and uh, pass it to Ajahn Isabel.